Well, you're back for another edition of Remasculate Podcast with your host, Steve Mudflap McGrew. Um, got a great guest for the show today. I'm just so happy that he said yes. I contacted him through Instagram, and the one, the only, Jeff Martyr says he'll do it. Jeff, how are you? Steve, I am good. You know, I'm hella reclusive, but I just wanted to say for you, uh, I will drop the Salinger, you know, and come out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and just let me say this, man. I just want to flip things around for just a second. Okay. Just let me say, I have so much love, unconditional love and respect for what you're doing, how you're doing it, the verb that you're doing it with. Um, dude, I don't know. You know, like Picasso was terrified of death. And that motivated him to crank out just ridiculous amounts of art. You know, uh, not each of you know, not every one of them tremendous. Right. But the fact that he produced, you know, it's up for debate. But someone says maybe almost four hundred thousand pieces of artwork in his lifetime. Um, I mean, dude, you're cranking out at like Picasso levels. <laughs> I'm like, scared of death. I think that's what it is. I'm scared of death. Well, now more than ever. But, uh, but, dude, just the amount of content that you're producing, you know, between your characters and just your stand-up, and uh, uh, it's just it's just a remarkable output. But I think your heart's in the right place, and I do think that we have a responsibility as just as just creatives. That's all. Not 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 in terms of people that are um, has-beens like myself or people that are currents like yourself. I just think that if you have the gift of creativity, you you have um, an obligation to utilize that, man, because it's just it's just so toxic out there. Well, it's thanks. I appreciate that. But I, I don't consider you a, a, a has-been. I absolutely do. <laughs> well, a has been is somebody that that just sort of kept going and faded away, but you decided to walk away, and and why yeah. was that? So, dude, thank you for that. So, I think I think it started in earnest, 1996 ish. Um, I was a single dad uh, coming back to California, and I had an opportunity to do. Um, a pilot for a date, not a date, this was a, I did so many dating shows, but this was a pilot called Your American Pop Quiz. And it's up, you know, somewhere on my YouTube channel. And so we did three of these shows for Fox. Brett Hudson, executive producer, one of the Hudson brothers. Hudson brothers, yeah. And, um, dude, it was really strong work. It was a great idea. And um, everyone at Fox was jacked up. And so... Uh, Brett believed in the project and he wanted it on Fox in Access. So Access for for the TV, uh, uh, you know, just TV watchers would be, it's the hour before primetime kicks in. And so they were like, hey, man, we really like the show. Let's roll it out on uh, FX. Right now, dude, we're talking like 1996. Mm-hmm. FX was like, what the hell is that? Where is it? You know, you couldn't find it. You're right. Know? And, and Brett was adamant about having it on Fox Network in Access. And they were like, hey, man, uh, here's the thing. Good luck to you. Here's your project back. And at that moment, so that's 96, that's when I was like, okay, I have had multiple opportunities. 1990, I did Martyr at Midnight, my own late night. I remember that. Yeah, that was like, that was going to be for, you know, like, uh, you know, a strip show, Monday through Friday, like Conan, like Jimmy Kimmel, like... And I had the chance for that. You know, that's also up. I had all these opportunities. And then I, I really knocked it out of the park. I have a very low bullshit quotient. I did really strong work on your American pop quiz. When I learned it wasn't about, like, things that I can control, I got scared, dude. And I just was watching my kids grow up young at that time. And I was like, this is terrible, man. My whole career is built on clay feet. It's like you can suit up, show up, do tremendous work. And some dude that you never meet in a suit, you know, 82 piece suit goes, no. And it's like, you know, you're back to like the clubs. And so that terrified me. And then I kind of by 2000 ish, I was into um, the Internet pretty heavily. I was kind of seduced by the fact that there was no there there 
and this technology was going to take over the world. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the I kind of disappeared hardcore, dude, until about nine years ago. Now, here's an interesting thing that will be done with me all about me. So. <laughs> Uh, listening to myself talk, I'm like, I fucking hate this guy. Um, no, no, it so, sounds good because I think people need to find out where yeah, you've been. Maybe, maybe, okay, okay. So then, um, due to uh, my sister, uh, who was the chief marketing officer for a company called Iconics Brand Group, at that time, their portfolio consisted of like 40 spectacular iconic brands. Uh, their stock was flying. They were like a $2 billion market cap company. And I had the opportunity to become the, the voice for really well-known brands, including, you didn't know this, but uh, no one does actually, but uh, including Joe Boxer, um, Starter Brand, uh, Sharper Image, um, London Fog. So I was doing the social media for about a half decade. So wow, big names. Right. Right. It was just it was just a really cool thing. I could work from anywhere. You know, I could I, I could, you know, kind of adopt different voices, different attitudes for the brands. And I love that stuff. You know, and then that went away. And so, I, dude, I just kind of like, you know, I just kind of like laid low. Um, and but that's what brought me back to Facebook. I was about three, four five years late to the social platforms only because I was like, you know what? I already danced in a world that was very public. And now I'm just going to just, I don't know, just fade, man. I just, you know, I didn't mind it. I was always creative in my head. But, you know, when when Facebook, you know, I came out of Facebook as a business proposition and it's kind of stayed in it now, which is how we reconnected, and, you know. Right, right. So that's that's what I did. But can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. So you and I, we know of each other because we were cutting our teeth back in the 80s. You know, when, when comedy was fresh, clubs were fresh, there was tons of television being done, you know, and there, there wasn't a year that went by where you and I, as that type of tier of comic, weren't doing two or three television shots per year. Right. Okay. Yeah, I did all of those. So, Steve, so how long did you ever live in L.A.? I lived in L.A. Uh, from 93 to 97, late 97. But I'd been working in L.A. since 87. I, okay. I kept going back and forth. The first time I ever worked, uh, Paula Poundstone got me in at the Ice House in 87. Okay. And I only played the Ice House one time, and it was never actually as a stand-up. As like I didn't do my set. I just taped. Rosie O'Donnell's um, stand-up spotlight there. Yeah, BH1. Yeah, uh-huh. and uh, I still have the jackets like somewhere <laughs> uh, because she gave great swag. Well, um, you, you know, I don't know if you've done this, but I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the show. I've kept every piece of uh, a garment, uh, whether it was a shirt, a jacket, or whatever, from whatever TV show I was on. I've saved it in my closet as like – one day, if I ever want to have, you know, got famous and had the museum, like, here's the shirt I wore on Star Search, second episode. Here's wow. the jacket I wore on MTV Half Hour. You know, that kind of. That's tremendous. Well, it's like a cool way to, like, scrapbook your life. So here's my question to you. I don't, I'm turning the tables for a reason. Because sure. Because I think you're an interesting cat. But I don't think everyone knows. Like, I think people know your characters. I see Liberal Larry has, like, a massive following on Twitter. Yeah. You know, I was like, but, dude, so explain to me the transformation, the McGrew transformation. You kind of went from, like, rockabilly dude, and then, like, you wound up in Denver on radio winning all these CMA awards. Like, what? Like, take me through, like, what years was that? Like, how did you how did you get out of L.A. alive <laughs> and, and, and keep your career you know, uh, a flourish. Well, I, I had sold uh, a pilot. I, I created a TV show for, for Disney and it was called trailer trash. And it was with APA. They, they sold it to, to Disney for me and it was all in development. And I went and did the Montreal comedy festival and got picked as like one of the best comics, had my jokes quoted as some of the best of the festival. And then I got nothing out of the festival. Nothing came out of it. And I heard later, well, it's because he already has a deal. Well, then the deal fell apart at Disney. They, they didn't re-up my, my uh, contract with him, and they let the, the show go away. So at that time, I thought, all right, I'm going back to Denver. I'm taking the money I made, and I'm buying a house because I can't afford one here. 
So I started working at this time. I was working at London a lot. My manager was British, so I was doing a lot of shows in London. And uh, then I got a radio offer while I was out. I was in Australia, and I got a radio offer to come do radio in Denver. And I thought, well, that I live in Denver. What's the difference between going to a TV studio or a radio studio? You're just going to go be something else, play somebody else. So that's what I did. I took that radio job for oh, – Oh, uh, one to two, almost eleven years, almost twelve years, yeah, but I never, but I never got out of uh, stand up. I'd still do it on the weekends. All the weekend clubs would still have me, like uh, Hyenas Comedy Club or uh, the Ice House would still let me do weekends. So I'd get off the air and fly, fly somewhere and do weekend comedy. So I never completely got out of stand up. Right, and there were guys like the Denver guys, and I listen, man, I'm so out of the you know loop. But uh, Michael Florwax, he was in in Denver yep, doing radio, yep. right? Right. And then, right. And then Dino Tripodis uh, had this morning run in Columbus, Ohio. That was tremendous. Bill Leff in Chicago on WGN. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for guys to go, you know what? Like the road is going to kill you at some point. You might as well hunker down, make some money, you know, uh, locally in th- whatever medium. Yeah. That's Incredible, dude. Yeah, because I, I had been offered radio several years earlier, and I thought, no, nah, I'm a comic. I'm not a radio DJ. Because how many times have you been at a club and you saw that DJ come and open a show and bomb so bad? You know? <sighs> and you know, and, and the thing was, you go, wait, that guy is making, you know, six digits. Right, like, right. If, you know, in a local market. Right. I'm killing myself, you know, to maybe make. You know, we're going back, you know, to the 80s and 90s, but to make 60, 70 grand, you know, but, you know, airports and, you know, planes, trains, automobiles. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, dude. Here's what I want to say. Uh, and I'll say it on behalf of all the people that haven't. You got so strong, Steve. Um, you had uh, Jimmy Schubert on last week or the week before it all blurs. Yeah, Schubert you know, last week. Oh, my God. And I mean, he's a monster dude and uh like all these guys on stage you know when i actually consider just like briefly like i mean like milliseconds like yeah could i ever get back on stage i'm like no fucking way you know it's like i've been out too long um to to where like you guys command the stage in a way now you found your voice the material flows you know, it's just a beautiful thing to watch so with no uh, hard feelings just as a fan I love the craft so much I just don't think there's anything more honorable than really really good stand up just let me say man you have become uh, a, a force to be reckoned with on stage would not want to follow you oh. <laughs> follow Schubert you know and and uh, and I say that like in the most loving like so proud like tears in my eyes proud like that's what it looks like when someone sticks with something you know, three and a half, four decades. Yeah. That's, well, thank that's, you. That, that's a lot. Of, it's a lot of times like people just, you know, have, what's the secret of comedy? And I think it's just uh, keeping doing it. It just stay yeah. doing it. Don't don't quit. If you have a low point, you know, just stick with it. Keep punching. Yeah, I was really friendly, um, you know, for the last few years with Buddy Hackett. And, you know, I would watch these guys and they got older. And, and, you know, they were old guys off stage. And then there was something magical about them on stage. They just got better. Comics only get better. Yeah, my mom asked me one time, she was like, how long do you think you can do this? And I go, how old was George Burns when he died? He was booked at Caesars. Yep, yep. I think yeah. he was 99 when he died. Yeah, they literally had to prop him up. They would literally put him on the stool behind closed curtains and, uh, put, you know, and then, and then raise the curtain. He would do whatever he would do. Lower the curtain, they'd go and, you know, scrape them off the stool. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the Ollie Joe Prater thing, huh? Yeah, I guess, right? I mean, yeah. So here's so here's basically where I was going with – I'm going to try to bring this full circle so we're not just doing like some, uh, you know, like tour of our past. I just wanted to know your past because I find it fascinating. The character that you've created, the verb, like I said, which you crank out material um, – I think what's happened, like Facebook, social platforms, especially for comics, it's become so toxic because we are so politically divided. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and it, it, it freaks me out. There's people that, like, I'm in awe of their chops. 
And yet, they're, I'm going to just use this term because I think everyone will understand it, but their, their Trump derangement syndrome yes, uh -huh. has, like, talk about a virus. This thing has taken over their creative minds. And all they do is post this vitriolic, you know, snarky stuff. And it's like, okay, like, I'll buy in. Where's the punchline? And there isn't. And so um, I think it's particularly, you know, it's, I think it's just particularly bad right now, you know, when the people that you're counting on, uh, you know, ha have lost their birthright, man. Like, you, you know, we're a different breed. And uh, I don't care how anyone wants to, you know, interpret that but comics are a different breed yeah and i agree have, have some loyalty to the creative process and i try to write every day you know i post these you know kind of tweet length things on facebook um your posts are great by the way you're, you're great one-liner jokes for it they're perfect social media postings right thank you I, I really like i try to craft them you know um i don't spend too much time i just try to capture this leading thought you know, and then concretize it by just, you know, getting those black, you know, black and white. You know, I just post, you know, white letters against the black background. And, you know, most of them work. I think like anyone, I'm just like looking for like the perfect smart man's dick joke. And I'll be doing that the next 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, just to be like, just to be honest, there's nothing better than a smart man's dick joke because oh, dick no. jokes always work. And if you can make it smart, right. bam, yeah, bullseye. Dick. Yeah, a big dick joke. That would be even better. <laughs> so oh, I remember the the when I first saw you work, you were doing – and it was very impressive. I mean I remember this. That's why it stuck with me. was the two microphone, two sides of the brain thing. Yeah, comedy for both hemispheres of the brain. Yeah. So it was an interesting approach. You know, like this is like – look, we're going back. I'm smiling now because when I hear people say things like Stephen, they go, well, you know, my brand – and you're like, brand? What the fuck? <laughs> Did we ever use the word brand? We never said like, oh, that's not my brand or my brand. We, we never spoke. Like, we weren't like the Insta models. You know? No, I had no idea what, what that was. The closest thing the closest theory. thing to that would be when, when I was starting comedy with like Hicks and Kennison and those guys, we would, we would give each other jokes that we thought of because we'd go like, this is more like you. You know, right. you, do you want this? This is more like you. Right, but I never, ever, not one time in like 20 plus years, I never referred to anything that I did as a brand. Yeah, but nobody ever came up and went, hey, Jeff, do you want this joke? It's more your brand. Yeah, it's more your brand. Anyway, yeah, so here's the thing. So the two microphones was a way to deal with um, longer form comedy and then the just the, the, the like kind of like what would be now considered like the tweet link type one-liners. And here's how this thing um, occurred. So I was married at the time. Rita Rudner, remember her? I remember Rita, uh-huh. The ballerina turned comic. Mendes comic, like, like, you know, like kind of our um, – she, she was maybe a graduating class before us. Yeah. They had that – had the way to craft one-liners the way that Wendy Liebman has the way to do that now, just these kind of like awesome, like – well written, you know, just bulletproof, you know, joke uh, jokes, uh, uh, jokes. But here's the thing. But remember, they have to like, the, you know, Rita and Wendy, very similar in the fact that they stand there and they're, you know, they like they're disarmingly. Uh, uh, I don't know. They're just, you know, they're just they just have their jokes. They're not going to act it out. They're not going to do voices. You know what I mean? Right, right. Okay, you know, they're not Rick Overton, dude. They're not going to, like, you know, Lenny Bruce these things and, you know, set up the premise and then do voices, whatever it takes to get it across. So what happened was Rita came over to play makeup and hair uh, at the apartment. And I'm sitting at the desk while they were in, you know, like kind of like the bathroom. And I said, hey, Rita, what do I do with all these one-liners that don't fit into my act? And she said from the bathroom area you're gonna have to do an act that's just all one-liners and literally before she finished saying that sentence the thing just popped in my head and went two microphones and that's how it 
it just, you know, that's how you get it. Like sometimes you get like a burning bush and that's what it was, man. It was a nugget. Uh-huh. All, all it was, Steve, was two microphones. That's all I got. And then it took a little while to craft that out. You know, Polish it up. Even, yeah, dude, Bud Friedman, I would go in, I'd go, I need two microphones at the Improv on Melrose. And he'd be like, what for? What the fuck? And I'd like, <laughs> trying to work on something. And then the interesting thing was, like, you know, I, I, like I had done an HBO special. I had all this other stuff behind me. I saw Mike Dugan do The Tonight Show um, that he recently posted again, his first Tonight Show. And he had such command. And I was like, man, maybe I should audition for The Tonight Show because Johnny's already announced he's, like, leaving next May. I never wanted to do it. I didn't grow up in a house that deified Carson. Uh, my parents weren't, like, late-night devotees. But once he announced that he was leaving, I was like, how could I not do it? Right. You know? So I said to Jim McCauley, the talent coordinator, I said, hey, Jim, can I ask you a question? I go, you know the thing I do with two microphones? And he was like, yeah. I was like, do you think that I can do that on The Tonight Show? And he said, I don't see why not. And by that time, dude, I mean, you know, I was like 13 years in. I mean, it was like, you know, I auditioned for him on a Tuesday night, called me into his office on a Wednesday, looked up on his whiteboard, Steve, and he goes, Wednesday, August 1st. I go, yeah, it's two weeks from right now. He goes, you want to do the show? And I'm like, uh. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, no, here's what he said. He goes, would you have problems being on the show with another comic? I was like, mm, depends on who the comic is. And he looks at the board. He goes, Don Rickles. And so I thought to myself, well, Rickles is going to put Carson in a great mood. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, no, no problem. So he goes, okay, done. And the show was Rickles, myself, and then the Allman Brothers band. Oh, sweet. Surreal. Getting there at one o'clock and watching like the Allman Brothers sound check, and you're like, wait, there's Greg fucking Allman. <laughs> I'm the only person in the audience. You know? So, I mean, look, we have great stories, you know? I, I just think uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know. Yeah, my my uh, Tonight Show story, um, I got approved. Macaulay saw me. I went to the office, got all my set approved. Um, he took me down to the stage. As you know, like, there's Johnny's spot. Don't stand there. You right, know, exactly. You stand over here. Do this. Love that. And then um, I got bumped. And I never got booked back on. And I ran into Macaulay several years later, right? Well, before he died, you know, he was at the improv and he's Which, like, by the way, the best time to run into someone at the improv before they die. No, before they die. Yeah. But he, he said to me, he goes, man, I'm really sorry that happened to you. He goes, I know that Carson was the biggest thing to everybody, uh, you know, cause he retired and I didn't get on. And he was like, apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. And I was like, well, you know, that's the way my career has gone. I get really close every time. Just no, no ring. Right. Steve, how many weeks a year do you average on the ships? Um, typically, typically two weeks a month, but sometimes three if they if they actually need me. But I'm, I'm getting a little burnt on that, you know. Well, thank God. But let me say this. You photograph your journey really well. Not just your coffees in different ports, but I mean like, you know, I mean. Shooting blogs. John McDowell does a great job of actually like going out and photographing the cities, you know, Yeah, uh, that you're in. So I follow you like that, you know, just, it's, it's just, I, I also understand. I see these guys and they go, Hey, uh, another 30 hours and then I'll be home. And I'm like, Oh my <laughs> God, like I don't miss that shit at all. Like oh. in any way, shape or form. It's brutal. All you want to do is get to the fucking microphone. Just, I just want to make people laugh. And you go like, yeah, now I got to catch like this flight. And if that flight doesn't make it, I can't get to Antigua. And then I won't get the submarine that will get me to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's true. But you know, this is this is how bad it is for me for travel wise. I I had to go do a show. Well, not a show. I had to go meet a ship in Rome, and I was packing. And I was complaining about having to go get on this ship in Rome. And my wife goes, shut up. There's people that work all their lives and save up to go on a vacation. They are paying you to go to Rome. I go, I know, but it's like a 20-something hour flight. And then by the time I get to, she goes, shut up. Oh, man. You know, I'm complaining about being paid to go to Rome. 
Well, the thing is like this, dude. You know, it seems like you finally, like, I don't know, you know, your historicals, um, but I will say this. I think that had, had, if, I, if I was with Victoria, uh, uh, who I'm with now, back in the day, I think I would have stuck with comedy. I think I, I think, I think having the proper uh, woman behind you, you know, or whomever, like you partner with, is just, you got to have that other half, the, the person who encourages you, like uh, Janet, who, again, I don't know personally, but I, I've seen you guys do those fucking videos. On, yeah. Like, you know, those things, you know, between the ramen noodles and <laughs> this one with the blast new asshole, like this thing. <laughs> you know, like, what is that thing that you guys do? Like the hot? We, yeah, we do a called, thing called trying stuff, where people send us, like, really hot products, like hot chips or hot salsa or hot yeah. noodles and yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and that's covered by, you know, Obamacare, like that kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of, one of the things I, I got lucky with with Janet, I guess, is because she was a radio DJ herself. She went to school for communication and broadcast. She has her degree in that. So she I'm kind of doing what she would have liked to have done, you know, uh, so she's very supportive of the industry. But more than that, dude, she, I mean, like, like, this is a woman who's watching you, like, take off your shirt, <laughs> you know, she's got the, the fake teeth guy to deal with, the foil hat guy to deal with, uh, the trucker guy to deal with. I mean, she's married to a lot of dudes. I mean, you know. Yeah, sometimes she wakes up and goes, now, who are you this morning? <laughs> exactly. I mean, role playing is just, you know, it's not necessary in your relationship. It's well, like... I'm I'm doing sort of what you said you were doing with those products. You said, remember how you were saying like you were could have each personality could write about the product and that kind of yeah, that's the brand. Right. the brand. That's sort of what I what I've kind of I have to put myself in those moods. And it was I read this thing by Michael Madison Madison the actor, and he was talking about how he had trouble auditioning, but if you put him in co uh, in costume, he can play whoever you want him to be. Interesting. And that's sort of the way I feel like when I go in there, I put a tin foil hat on my head and stick the fake teeth in. I can be that character like like that. And as soon as do I take you think in character, Steve, I do what? Do you think in character? I do. And a lot of times I'll, I, I riff those those videos. Uh, I'll riff them two or three times and then pick the best the best one because right. I just want to be in character and think like that character. Because I can't – I don't write like most people. I don't sit down at a computer and try to write jokes. I'm, I almost always instinctively uh, ad-lib or play a character. I see that in your club sets. Like I see when you have an idea and then you're working it out. Um, the, your most recent set – dude, I sound like a stalker. I'm listening to myself and I'm like, dude, you know too much about this guy. <laughs> well, I but, appreciate that. But I'm a fan, so I mean – so I don't feel badly in that way. But uh, your most recent set in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, that's where you were, right? Mm -hmm. Tulsa? Yeah. And to me, like, you know, I, I, I'm kind of inside – you know, I'm an insider's view, but I kind of know, oh, oh, okay. Like he's working – like – the audience thinks they're just watching his act, but he's actually writing this as he goes along. And they were so responsive. Then like your secondary and your tertiary tags, you know, those are like, Oh, oh okay. Like that works. Like that's going to stay in. Like I, I'm smiling as I say this, cause I understand that process and the audience gets a great show. Yeah. Like well, you, like I, I, I'm, you're, like you're totally you're right. Cause live. you're, you're blowing jazz at that moment. I love that description because that's exactly the way I, I'm just sort of riffing and hoping if it works, it goes into the next show every like that's how it works every time. And that's why you saw those video. I, I posted those those I think it was three of them, basically the same opening set of working on the covid stuff. Right. That's yeah. What I'm saying. Right. Because I actually realized like, hey, man, this is going to be like the last of these for a while. I mean, I don't know how much like club work you've lost, but I would think. I mean, I would think that, that people lost a, a, a grip of work. I mean, I, I am officially out of work for two months. I uh, lost clubs and ships right now. At, at, at the, just for right now, I, that's not to say you know if it's going to come back or not. But for two months, I am. I've had clubs great. and ships canceled. This is great. I mean, not great that you lost work. That sucks ass. But what I'm saying is. Um, you know, I don't know how your quarantine period is going. What what I do hope, Steve, is that my sense 
is that post quarantine or whatever the hell we're calling it, you know, um, like that people have, like take some sense of like curating their own lives. Like this is a lot of time to sit and reflect about choices that you've made and choices that you will make. And, you know, you better be with the person you care to watch the world burn with because, you know, that's kind of, that's, I think that's what this is partly about, right? Like, yeah, I, I agree. I think that I, I was telling Janet, my wife, this the other day, I, I almost feel like this is a great opportunity to hit the reset button on people's lives. That you go back, you reconnect, you're out walking your dog again, you're not you're not living a rush because you can't go anywhere. Yeah, you can go to the grocery store or maybe the post office, but you're not living this super fast life. So maybe it's a chance for humans to take a deep breath and go, I kind of like nature again. Yeah, I think it's a chance to just – I think everything's up for, for inspection and introspection. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, uh, if, you know, divorces spike a bit, you know, a after this, um, for no other reason, you know, than couples make have come to certain decisions, you know, after being, you know, stuck in an attic, you know, this is like the Anne Frank years for all of us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, I mean, well, you I know me, I mean, you know, we're behaving right now, but, you know, you and I DM each other. Uh, direct message. I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm such a rabbit hole guy, you know, uh, that, you know, I, I mean, we're, we're just keeping, uh, we're, we're not doing like the, the, you know, the tin foil teeth in guy now, but when right. you do, when you do that, I'd love that because I go like, you know, people think like it's a, such a great way to, uh, make people aware of, you know, of the blacklist script that's also playing out in the background, you know, and that's what blew me away about Schubert too. I thought he had a really, really good grasp on what's, what is happening in parallel. Yeah. Well, I, I think what's really nice is, is like you, you, you and Schubert both are, are, you know, you are Hollywood types or you've been there, you've lived there, you know, the business, but yet you're smart enough to realize I am not going to hate on what's happening right now. I, I'm smart enough to realize things are changing, and maybe Trump is fixing some stuff. So here's you want to hear my theory on this, and you know this may be like uh, shocking to, to some. So let me tell you, you know how I told you how I got into the two mics. Let me tell you how I came to supporting this administration. Um, so I was a Bernie guy. I donated to his campaign. Uh, multiple times back in 2015 and I was watching, you know, what he was saying and I was like, yeah, fuck, it sounds great. Like free shit for everyone. I mean, I actually thought like we spend so much money, so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I wasn't behind like kind of like lifting up people in any, any way uh, uh, that, that we could. Um, and then I, I, I thought to myself, okay, and I'm dude, I was MSNBC. I watched Rachel Maddow every night. What? Her. What? Dude, listen, listen. Lawrence, um, what's the guy who followed her? The blonde dude? Oh, yeah. He's gone now, too, though, isn't he? Isn't he? I think so. Well, um, so, so, um, and, you know, I think that that guy, I think he, he was, like, on the writing staff of uh, West Wing. Um, so, I, so one day I just decided, and I watched the – the election like sports. I said, I'm going to follow this thing like baseball from spring training all the way to the world series. I'm going to know every player. I'm going to know every one of their stats. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was hardcore into the, the election cycle 2016. And one day I said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to flip on the evil Fox network. I want to see how they're covering the news, just, you know, the election news. And I was watching this thing, and I'm getting used to the new characters and faces and, you know, attitudes. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, man. They're covering the same stories, and I'm hearing completely different uh, uh, sides to this. And then I started to, like, you know, self-educate. I started to fill in the blanks, you know, on the Internet. You have to be. Right. Look it up. Well, you have to you have to source this stuff for yourself, and it doesn't matter where, but you just need more than you know the mainstream media uh, drilling whatever propaganda that you may choose to find palatable into your head. 
And that's when, uh, you know, at the same time now I'm watching, you know, Bernie, you know, pulling these crowds 20K. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then they stole the election. You know, they stole the nomination from him. And, you know, I was terrified of Hillary. And, I, you know, I'm not a fan of dynastic politics. And I'm like, oh, my God, if it's another Clinton, like, we're dead. Man. We're going to go to war with Russia. You know, I had that whole, like, apocalypse. If she gets elected, like, we're, we're you know, that's it. It's yeah. Like, you know, doesn't matter how many times you hit that red button from Staples, we're fucking dead. So um, the point was, I watched them. I watched uh, uh, Bernie acquiesce and then, uh, you know, get his, you know, another second, you know, another home on the lake. And I'm like, okay, man, this is like something is rotten. And and I just thought to myself, uh, I'm going to I'm going to watch what this administration does. And I and, and, and I think t- Trump is probably one of the worst public speakers I've ever seen. Uh, I thought he was terrible during The Apprentice. He's virtually just a little bit better now. You know, like three point whatever years he is in. But I do believe that the administration. Is you know, I'm a QAnon guy from day one, post one. Ah, so I'm you know, and that that just appeals to me, even though it makes me like incredibly unpopular in my own house. Um, you know, I'm in a house of brilliant critical thinkers, and they're always like disappointed that I'm like the conspiracy guy. You know, uh, uh, but but I do believe because I want to believe that there's something playing out in the background that will drain the swamp, that will take down corruption, that will put us, like, at a better place uh, than where I thought we were, you know. Before. Let me let me ask you a question. How do you, how do you describe, when somebody says a Q9, or how do you de- describe Q to somebody that's like, you really believe that? Yeah. Um, well, here's the thing. That's the really good thing about, like, not talking to anyone. It doesn't come off that often. But what I will say is, um, there's pretty good videos, like prim- like you know, videos that, that kind of go through the QAnon phenomena. But my understanding is this: first of all, there's QAnon people like in the community that are just fucking nuts, dude. They are your character with the tin foil, exactly. Head. And I mean, dude, you know, and that's really not the, the part that you know I'm, I'm attracted to, you know. Um, I'm attracted to the way I understand QAnon is this, as a core group of no more than 10 people, seven of them being military, three of them being non-military, that have an understanding of a 20 plus year plan to drain the swamp, to expose the deep state, uh, and to actually return, you know, government by the people, for the people, to the people, in in its most concentrated form, and it's like the bullion cube of my understanding. That's how I look at the QAnon phenomenon. Now, look, now we're you know two plus years into this thing. We're three thousand three hundred or three thousand nine hundred drops later, and it's really really complex stuff. But one of the things that does come up repeatedly in the QAnon movement and the QAnon drops, uh, is this concept of, quote-unquote, future proves past. And there are these, like, fabulous kind of, like, well, wait a minute, like, at what point is it mathematically impossible that these things are no longer coincidental? So um, I think Trump is part of the plan. Um, You know, I can't imagine how many enemies they're fighting on how many different fronts. Oh, can you imagine? No, I can't. I really no. It's it's so complex, um, and I think you know, for lack of I mean, it's it's a hackneyed kind of concept. But you know, they talk about multi-dimensional chess, or you know, Trump, quote unquote, is playing 4D chess. Yeah, I've heard that. But, uh, yeah, I think the whole administration is, you know, and and at least look. Here's what it does. It keeps me from being deranged. It it is as mad as I may sound to someone who disbelieves or someone who just has all this vitriol that they've saved up for Trump, you know, uh, uh, I'm not living with that kind of anger. I'm living with a generalized hope. And one of the things I I think that I envy about you is somewhere along the line, you made your peace 
with like like uh, like. So I'm living in North Carolina now, right? I'm out of a big city. Beautiful there, I'm, dude. It's it's really beautiful. It's physically beautiful. It's very green. You know, 30 years, man. I lived in in LA, and it was just, you know, how much cement can you take? Yeah. You know, how much madness can you take? You know, and and the quality of life got got you know uh, uh, oppressive and expensive. Um, but you you kind of you, you connect with a, a different audience. I mean, you go out and you do that uh, deplorables tour. Like that's a swath of America that I was really kind of removed from and had a lot of judgments against. And I've made my peace with the more simple approach to life. The people that you know are, uh, live live with their understanding of uh, uh, you know their relationship to a creator. You know. Yeah. And, well, I I think you you have found what what so many that people that live in Middle America have known forever that. There's much more in the middle than the two coasts, and the two coasts are the entertainment capitals. So they they try to dictate what the rest of us are supposed to hear, like, and love. And Middle America is just like, no, we're tired of you. We're tired of – we won't even buy your movies anymore. You know, we're – So patient. You know, Steve, didn't you think, dude, realistically, okay, and I can't imagine that anyone who's listening to this will disagree with what I'm about to say. Didn't you think – for all intents and purposes, it was over for Trump with the whole, like, grab, grab her by the pussy line. Like, that's it. Like, now he's going to lose the center of the country. He's going to lose the evangelical right. Like, he was on the border, you know, of alienating those people. You have this brash New Yorker, Queens, Richie Rich, right? Yep, I and, agree. And then I was like, God damn. Yeah, this is going to hurt, especially right here before the election. That's it. It's over. It's over. And then what was interesting it's just just this dynamic that you just that you just kind of identified, like the middle, the middle of the country, flyover country, right? The deplorables, the part that everyone just ignored. Not only did they forgive him, they just kind of like went, yeah. I mean, they were like, yeah, that he probably did, and I've I probably said worse, or yeah, I'd have probably I'd done it too. Down, right? right, and so and so it was those types of moments where I watched kind of like. I said, well, this is going to knock all the dominoes down, and then it didn't. And I was like, okay, man, I need to, I need to get off of my elitist, you know, uh, uh, um, New York, LA experience, and reassess, you know, just that those people that you said, man, just just the people that actually are the fabric of America, and and, and I just I found myself to be like a lot less deranged once I had gratitude for people. You know that dance the different dance, man. I just, you know, I just, I, I kind of dig the, you know, the, the 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 pace of 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 North Carolina, of South Carolina, of waving at people and saying, "How you doing today?" and "What can I help you with?" and whatever. Just, you know, I mean, I get it. You know, listen, man, I'm never going to be like, you know, let's sit down and watch NASCAR for you know 18 hours. That's not my gig. <laughs> But, but, you know, but I, I, I grieve now like, you know, like the people I'm around when Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. Yeah, you're one of those. You're one of us now. Like, didn't Jesus feed people? How come they're closed on Sunday? Wait, wait. Well, here's the thing. If Trump wants to be elected emperor for life, he would sign an executive order, like, you know, making Chick-fil-A open on Sundays. And that would be it. He would serve you know, the next 60 years. <laughs> He could be our next king or the king. Yeah. We've never had a king, but he—I think people would actually go. I think make, he'd make a good king, right? Yeah, King Orange, King Orange the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me let me ask you now. You, I know you've thought about getting back into stand up. Are are you doing any sets at all? Do you go up once in a while at the club, local clubs? So, so here's here's the thing. The answer is no. Um, and I went on stage last. It was September 9th. Um, so that was 18. So 2008. So, so or 17. I don't even know. Paul Veneer, who I became very close with when I was up in Glen Cove, New York, for about three years, um, I would go see him when he would perform in Ronkonkoma out in Long Island. And he does these crazy ass, like, you know, three hour shows. Um, saw him do one time uh, two hours. 47 minutes, but who's counting? 
for 46 people. And I said to him after the show, I go, dude, you just worked harder at that show than I did my entire career. I go, I would never, ever work like that. Like, it was insane. Like, it's props and it's songs and it's stand-up and he works the crowd. He's got a photographic memory. My point is, he was uh, gracious enough to let me go up uh, for what I said would be five minutes. It turned out to be 11 minutes. And it was frightening as fuck. Um, I really felt like I was running 103 fever when they were introducing me, which is crazy. <laughs> it's something like where, you know, in the day, you could just wake me up at 3 a.m. and go, you're on in five minutes. It'd be like, okay, fine. Just point me. Yeah, yeah just, muscle memory. Right? But uh, no, this was terrifying. And I thought I'd do five minutes. I wound up doing uh, just about double that. And by the time I was done, uh, a couple of ad libs in, a couple of new jokes later, I was like, ooh, oh, it's very seductive. Maybe I should, you know, I should get back on. But, dude, I, I wouldn't know how to even approach it. So I think, uh, I think I'm, for all intents and purposes, pretty much done. I'll, I'll try to find some method uh, of, you know, trying to do, do the creativity. I would love to add some long form writing to those, you know, those short little uh, things that I post daily. Um, I have a lot to say. I just kind of don't sit down and really, you know, craft those things. Right. You know, well, long, long form writing, you know, multiple paragraphs. Um, that's like, you know, it's like working out your legs. That's like squats. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the internet is going to be your new, your new form. Maybe you could, you know, start working in some videos of yourself or, you know, I don't know. Dude. You're, 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 you know, you did that whole keto diet. I got to lose weight. <laughs> I got to do like the Steve McGrew keto. I mean, how much weight did you lose on keto? 35 pounds. Damn, you were fat fuck. I was. Wow. wow. Are you six feet? Uh, I'm 5'11". Okay. Right. All right. Well, I'm six feet, 196. So I got to get down, dude. And then maybe, you know, if I can stand. Like, I just, we were talking like before we started recording. Like, I can't even like FaceTime. Uh, without, without, like, you know, I'm like, oh my god, I don't, look at that, look, <laughs> look at that fucking pelican. I don't, it's just like, I can't. But yeah, maybe, dude. Who knows? I mean, what about podcasting for yourself? Have you thought about doing your own podcast? No, I have not, because I think the world needs another podcast. Like, you know, I mean, you know, I know some interesting people, but I, you know, no, dude. I think, I think, I'm, I think, I, I, I'm saying this lovingly. You know, and I'm hearing myself say it for the first time. I think I'm done because um, I, I don't know what I'm chasing. I, I, I wouldn't be chasing, you know, uh, uh, fame. I wouldn't be chasing notoriety. I think when we were young, you know, again, young, dumb, full of calm. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah. Dude, you know, it was like, oh, my God. You know, I was so competitive. I will say that. I, I, here's my regret. My regret is um, I, I had d uh, dinner um, in September when I was out in L.A., with Mark Blutman, who did that Crusher comic, you know, stand up, uh -huh. and then he, and he went on to uh, Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World, and he said to me over dinner, he said, "Do you have any regrets?" And I said, "I do, Mark." I said, "I was so aggressive in trying to make it. Um, I hope I wasn't douchey. I was just creatively aggressive. I mean, I was always writing. I was always working." I was like Kobe Bryant, like his first like 10 years. I did not play well with others. Mm -hmm. but we're like a lone wolf. I just didn't, didn't dislike other comics, wasn't particularly competitive. I just was just working so hard to quote unquote make it without even knowing what the hell that meant. So he said to me, what, what did you fuck up on? I go, you know what? I never got to write on a writing staff. I would have liked to have that experience of like showing up with a group of people you know? Yeah, I thought that too. Yeah. Because I, yeah, because I was friends with Roseanne, you know, from his, her here in, in Denver, and I always thought, I wonder why I never got a chance to write for Roseanne, or what? Wonder why she didn't tell somebody else on, on another show that I'd be a good person, you know? Why do you think that was? Um, I, she told me later because I've talked to her since then, is that she just felt like the networks had so much control, you know, that she couldn't really bring in too many of her friends that she already brought in a bunch of people. And you know, I, I, I kind of understand that, but at the same time, I always thought, well, maybe it's competition too. That you know, that so, sometimes people don't want other people around. That that they were well, we we were competition in the clubs, right? But then you get to a part where you've got so much money in the bank that you really 
you can't be hurt in that way. Like no one's going to steal, you know, your star off of Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, Roseanne made a fortune. Just think of what she had. Just think of the check she had to cut to Tom Arnold. Oh like, yeah, that talent was fucked. I mean, that was like a thirty-eight million dollar check she had to cut to him because she had no prenup. Damn. Get a prenup. Always get a prenup. <laughs> yeah, unless you're like me, unless you got nothing left. You know? <laughs> well, you know what's, what's funny? I don't. I, I I think you are actually outside. Am I right? So yeah. So here's the thing. Because every once in a while, I hear a nice, beautiful bird. Yes, I'm outside because I, I haven't been. It's actually raining. I don't even care. Uh, I'll just die of just you know regular pneumonia. Nothing. Nothing exotic. Hold on. Let me just tell you. I started when I started talking to you. My Fitbit said 29, 15 steps, 29, 2, steps, and now up to like fifty five hundred steps. I, I'm a, like, are you a pace guy? Can you like talk on the phone? And yes. Or yeah. I my my house is uh is like a big open box, and uh, I walk in circles around the right, living right. Li- exactly. living room, kitchen, living room, yeah. dining room, kitchen, living room. Di- I just walk in a big yeah. circle. That's exactly, this is what I'm doing. Exactly outside. I look like I look like a retarded kid just like around the neighborhood. Like I'm going full retard. That's exactly what I'm doing. A podcast going full retard in the rain. And your neighbors are wondering what what's he doing out there? Exactly. Exactly. We're inside people. Don't you miss Kevin Meany? I I posted that the other day. Just I would I was thinking like his his COVID quarantine videos would be awesome. Uh, oh my god. God. I was thinking about him the other day when I, I saw somebody complaining about uh, skinny jeans on guys, and I thought, we're big pants people. Oh, my God. We're dude. big what? pants. Get those I'm, off. You're big pants people. People should just just look up Kevin Meany and his Tonight Show spots when he does that We Are the World. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just one for the time capsule, man. Well, one of the best things I saw Kevin ever do, and I don't remember which Tonight Show, but it might have even been his first, is when he, he goes, I just flew in from Vegas, and boy, are my arms tired. And then he turns to the band and goes, hey, some people might not have heard it yet. <laughs> he took an old joke and made it work. Right, and the balls that it takes, you know, um, like he, he, when I get nervous, I, I – the filter between my, my mind and my mouth is evaporates completely. And when I walked out on the tonight show after that surreal moment, when your face is behind the curtain, you can like smell the curtain. You're that close to it, Steve. So Johnny is reading my schedule. Oh, Jeff will be performing at bananas in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And you're like, this is so fucking surreal. You go, Carson is reading my schedule. So you walk out to your spot, like you said, right? Not yeah. Johnny's star, right? Just walk out to your spot. You know? uh, um, and, you know, the applause is all surreal. And I literally was so nervous. I said, thank you. That more than makes up for the people at home that weren't clapping. And the thing is, is that it threw me because, you know, like you, you kind of have notes on a cue card in front of you, you know. Yes. Nerve wracking, man. Nerve wracking. that after all those years of stand up, I, I still... I still let that that Tonight Show spot kind of like psyched me out a little bit, but it was you know, you know, it was Johnny for God's sake. Yeah, so, but you you did you did well. You you killed. I, 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 it was okay, man. It was just it was just something, you know. I remember calling Bill Left the next day and said uh, in Chicago and saying, "Does it upset you that you'll never get to do the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson? Does that hurt you when you think of the fact that, you know." Uh, you know, it was what it was, man. It's like all of this stuff. We are, we are playing some type of game of handoff. You know, like it's it's like we carried the torch. Um, this generation of comics that you know, many of their names that I don't know. Um, some of them I interact with on Facebook. Like the the, the, the form, the, the art form is in good hands. You know what I mean? Right. But, um, you know, we did our job, man. We, we, we brought comedy back as a as a as a night out. It became part of the, as they say in marketing, right? The consideration set. What are we going to do tonight? We're going to go to a movie. We're going to go bowling. We're going to go to a comedy club. Like we were part of that. We created that. that right. Part of, like, hey, man, that's like something to do. Well, remember the remember the old days. I was telling this to another comic the other day that. 
the the it used to be you, let's go to the improv or let's go to the comedy works or let's go to the comedy store. It was about going there and not about who you saw. You just knew you were going to have a good time at a comedy club. Was that your home club, the Comedy Works? Comedy Workshop in Houston. Houston. I started in Houston, and then I was with Hicks and Kennison and Pine, Jimmy Pineapple and all those guys. Andy Huggins, right? Andy those. Huggins, yeah. Yeah, okay. and, and then I moved out to uh, to L.A., I mean, in 87, that didn't move out, but started working there. And it was the Ice House and Bud Friedman that he gave me, Bud took me in. I became one of those guys. And then when in Denver, well, where did you play? What was home? Com- Comedy Works. Comedy Works in Denver. Yeah, still a tremendous, uh, a tremendous room, right? Bro, yeah. A lot of people now are, do, are filming their specials and recording albums here at that club. I, well, I, all I remember is, tell me if I, my sense of memory is good. At, at least going back to my era, like the, the ceiling when you stood on stage was like not terribly like you could, could you touch it? You could or? touch it. Yeah, okay. it, it was right. slightly right. above your head. Right. Okay. Right. Right. But that's what made that club so good. If it, if a, if and if you got a great laugh, it just boomed. It echoed. It was so such a tight club. So now let me turn this around, dude. What's your future? Where Where does Steve McGrew go? You know, post COVID quarantine. Like, let's say the the ships come back, the clubs come back. I think, you know, there's going to be a delay, right? I don't know how they're going to have to accommodate everyone's schedule. But but let's say let's say a year from now, you're back. You're back on the road. Yeah, the, I'm just going to go go back on the road, do what I do. I, I I've discovered new audiences with those characters that I've been doing online. So my audience is growing. And I, I, I talked to my acting teacher. I had an old acting teacher that I was uh, took acting back in the 90s and early 2000s. And I was telling him not long ago about how I felt like, oh, maybe I m- missed my my chance in Hollywood. And he goes, no, oh, you're thinking like a comic. you got to think like an actor. You know, they're going to need somebody 60, 70, 80, 90. You could do this now for the rest of your life if you wanted to. So that's – I've never totally given up on the fact that, you know, at one point somebody might look at me and go, hey, you'd be perfect for the uh, the, you know, biker in this movie. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, you still you got it, dude. Like you know, it's in it's in you. You still have that 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 burning, that aggression. You know, which is great. I mean, I think that's what you need. You need, you know, you need something uh, uh, that that keeps you know keeps that that, that flame. Well, when you're cre- a creative person, like any type of artist, if you were a painter or a musician, you would want to do that till the day you died, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, did- Right. Let me ask you this: Will you will you guys remount the Deplorables tour? Will that be a yes? There, we've already been talking about that. Uh, the the possibility of doing that uh, right closer to the election, if we can all get back together again. And were you playing to sold out houses when you were doing that? Yeah, yeah. We we sold out Cleveland. I think Nashville was sold out. There was a couple of other. We only did I think eight or nine dates at, before it, it got. Well, before Terrence got in an accident, I remember that Terrence Williams was with us. He's lucky to be alive, right? Dude. Big time. And so, if we could put that all back together, it was a great tour. And who closed? Like that's like here's that's what I always wanted to ask you. I who did. Closed? Did you? Yeah. All right, because I'll say this, dude. Like God bless Terrence, man. And like you know, he's found this voice, right? He's got he's got his brand, quote unquote. But but you know, out of the people that I recognized on that show, like you're the stand up. Like it's like, okay, like, you know, you can play nicely, but at some point if it's gonna be like, you know, hey uh, motherfuckers, this is mic drop time, <laughs> like I will close the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well that that's sort of the way it, it played out. I mean that because they knew that because Terrence was very good at it it's more like public speaking and I like that guy. Let's go see Terrence live and shake his hand. You know? And then the, oh, my daughter loves him. She's like, yeah. oh, the greatest thing ever. Well, yeah. I mean, he puts out a video and it's like, you know, several thousand to a million if Trump retweets it, you know, every, every time. And people are just like, oh, I love Terrence. And, well, Terrence, his videos aren't aren't particularly super funny. They're just very good. They're engaging, right. You're like engaged. Engaged, yes. Perfect, perfect analogy. You're engaged by him, you know. 
But it's the same thing. I, I did some shows with, with Tommy Lauren came out on and we did Mesa, Arizona. Tommy Lauren was there and uh, Officer Tatum. Both of them are very uh, personable, entertaining, bigger than life. But right. neither one of them, if they had to, could follow me. So no, no, th listen, that's sort of the way it works out. Show, right, man. It's like, great. Like, here's the thing. Go out there, do your little TED talk. You know what I mean? And I'm saying this lovingly, right? Right. Because you're building. Because what you're what you're doing with the deplorables tour is you're selling an experience. You know, it's uh, you know it's a lot of MAGA hats, and you know it's like a safe space for people that have been you know, largely vilified, you know, and told that you know that their their you know their their opinions are are lesser than. I mean, it's a beautiful, what you did is you create a beautiful echo chamber live. And I can only well, imagine you. that it's going to, you're welcome, but I, I can only imagine that's going to become more valuable, you know, as we, as we head towards November. I just think. Uh, yeah. And I think if Trump gets reelected, as we all know, he's going to in a massive landslide, uh, I think the next four years could even work well for the deplorables, for people that oh, want to feel oh. like, yeah, we're still in this. We still got this. Right. Well, that should keep you off the ships. Yeah, that's that's a I'm kind of thinking that too. Well, man, I appreciate you doing the podcast. This was a lot of fun. Voice, man, so good to just uh, you know have the back and forth. I hope it's not terribly boring to those uh, you know that that don't know you know our our history. Uh, but but uh, yeah, dude, thank you for getting me literally and physically out of the house. Well, I, I'm glad I could do that. Now, is there is there anything that you want to promote for yourself or that where they could just – they find you on Twitter? Are you on Twitter or just Facebook? I am, but you know something? Twitter really doesn't move. Twitter is all, believe it or not, it's all QAnon stuff. Um, yeah, I just think – no, I think, I think that um, – I, I think, no, man, just go back into the shadows. You know? <laughs> And just, just, you know, like I said, you know, just try to twist, just try to twist some thoughts and, you know, keep the humor alive and, and, you know, come, come through this unprecedented time, you know, ho hopefully healthy and on the other side. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, we are fighting some unseen enemy and I hope that when it's all said and done, you know, we're, we're telling stories 30 years from now, but dude, I love you. I, I appreciate everything that you do. And, uh, you know, I'll just write you some, some material that'll make me proud to see come out of your mouth. Oh, I appreciate that, man. All right. Thanks for doing the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Martyr. Thank you for doing this. And for you guys listening, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, share it with your friends. It's the only way people ever find a podcast is somebody has to share it and tell somebody about it because there's no advertising in podcasts. So God bless America. Go listen to some Oak Ridge Boys. I bid you adieu. Nice, dude. Well done.